the 21st of January, 19 years ago today, the representatives elected at this general election met in the Mansion House. They ratified the Republic, proclaimed in Ireland in Easter week 1916. They appointed a temporary executive and proceeded to take over and to exercise the functions of government in Ireland. For the next two years, there were two competing governments, each of which strove to exercise jurisdiction all over Ireland. One was the government elected by the people. The other was the government of the alien invader. One depended on the support of the mass of the people. The, other the voice of fellow Michael O'Flanagan speaking about the first Doyle Aaron of 1919, in the establishment of which he himself played a vital role. How is this controversial figure in the national movement remembered today, exactly a hundred years after his birth? Unfortunately, not enough of the younger generation, especially now, know about him. I have, in my own way, tried to make his fame known through some writings. But uh, too often nowadays, when I talk about Father of Flanagan, people confuse him with Father Flanagan of Boys Town. But the older generation who remember him well think very well of him, and they're very proud that a man like him uh, did so much in the period during which we were struggling for our independence. Well, I remember the part he took in the Count Plunkett election and the speeches he used to make. How he got us organised to form the old IRA. He was an individualist, but an individualist that uh, gave himself readily to such causes that had very little support in our country at that time, the cause of Republican Spain. He wasn't a doctrinaire Republican, you know. A lot of people think he was, nor was he a revolutionary. But he believed that a commitment was made in 1918, not 1916 now, and this is more, really mostly why I say that he wasn't a revolutionary. It was the will of the people in the 1918 election. I remember him, of course, in Irish public life as a, a patriot, a, a, a priest, and a public speaker. I remember his appearance very, very well. He was a fine, strong man, handsome, with an upright carriage. Uh, he con conveyed an impression of fearlessness, well-groomed and without blemish. He was a model of what one would expect an Irish priest to be. He was a stately man, a great orator, and a very sincere Irishman. On May day, I could miss you with her on a fracticular fad via on August the lyric session, so called August and Snow the Inche, or have Kirk and Keenan, Keenan Dana, my dear He was a great man. A great man. That's the verdict of many of his contemporaries on Michael O'Flanagan, the staunchest priest who ever lived in Ireland, in the words of Cahill Brewer. Where did he come from and what was his background? His niece, Mary O'Flanagan of Castlery, County Roscommon. Father Michael was born in Clonfour, about four miles west of here, and in the parish of Kilkeven, or Castlery, if you like, on the 13th of August, 1876. Uh, his uh, parents were farmers and they were natives of the parish in fact natives of the parish for as long as we can possibly trace and he was a great man for tracing things there were native speakers and uh, I remember both my grandparents when they didn't want us to know what they were talking about they spoke Irish well, they came from an area wh which would have been known as a black guilt at that one stage, and there would have been a certain amount of Irish. Now, he also came from an area where there was a profusion of Flanagans and O'Flanagans. In fact, uh, all the Flanagans there, they were so numerous that all of them had nicknames. They were never known as, as Flanagans. Uh, he would have been known as Michael Edmund because his father was Edmund Flanagan and his brother Pat Edmund he was Pat Edmund till the day he died and uh, his mother of course was uh, from the same area uh, a little bit further over than from where he was born in the village of Clone Fower. she was Crawley from Tatnoose 
And I do know that in that area there were people who were native speakers up to the early part of this century. Michael O'Callaghan, editor of the Roscommon Herald. How much Irish then had Michael O'Flanagan as a young lad growing up near Castle Ray? According to himself, not as much as he should have. In as the my grandparents were bringing up their own family, they considered it a disadvantage, and they, uh, uh, according to him and according to the other members of the family, they only spoke Irish when the children weren't there. They spoke English, uh, which they had learned at a, her- a hedge school. Uh, my grandfather himself actually uh, wasn't able to write uh, any. English. He never learned to, to write English. But Father Michael always said he was a better Latin scholar than he could ever hope to be. Mm. I have here a roll book uh, uh, in which the, 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 his entrance to the local school in Clunbanov. And you may be interested to know that that uh, uh, local school, uh, the headmaster in that local school at the time, was the grandfather of a friend of yours of Michal O'Callaghan's of the Ross Common Herald. And that actually is uh, Michal's uh, grandfather's writing here in front of us now. Entering him in uh, the Don School. It was known as the Don School. It is out in the in uh, uh, And, of course, you know who the O'Connor Don was. It's still known as the Dunn School. It's, it's, it's the oh O'Connor yes, Dunn, it, yes, the O'Connor Dunn gave the the uh, land for the church and the school and the teachers' residence, free grass and for nothing in those days. From the Dunn School, Michael O'Flanagan went to the Diocesan College in Sligo in 1890, and he did exceptionally well there, particularly in mathematics. He went to Maynooth in 1894 and was ordained priest in Sligo Cathedral in 1900. It was during four years he spent as a teacher in his former school in Summerhill that he first showed an interest, which he was to develop later, in social and economic matters. He was, if you like, a developer first. For instance, of the uh, more recent um, Irish patriots, shall we say, Fintan Lawler would have been his, his model, you know. And the first if you like, interest that he showed was in uh, uh, rural industries. I suppose that would be around about the time of the Congested Districts Board. Actually, he took five uh, young girls to America and they went around the cities of America prom- promoting Irish lace. And that was his first visit to America. He was always going to America. What year was that? Uh, 1906, As, but I'm not... I'm open to correction on the year. It might be five, it might be seven, it, but round about that time. His second trip to America was on diocesan business. It was to collect funds for the church in Loch Lynn, a very beautiful church that you should see, and for the establishment of the Franciscan... Uh, Missionaries of Mary Convent in Loch Lynn, a property that they bought from Lord Dillon. Father O'Flanagan on his tours of the United States showed a good understanding of Irish-American psychology. It said that he brought with him 32 sods of turf, one from each Irish county, and that the Irish-Americans willingly paid a dollar a time to tread once more on their native sod. To this period also date his active interest in the Irish language and his fundraising efforts for the Gaelic League. Donoghue o Sulawain, Stuarhoor ar Achtus na Gaelia. Cofad is hier le nedig a de taug ar Cwystig na Han Conra, agos yn lyn chyna, da chyrn Cwystig na he am ach gyd un ystad e'n te he, e ffein agos yn an macolum a bailiw erigid. Dan y drawn ystod am gyd un mi lwnus a nedig a doiog, nor a hann ar y wale. Da chyrn ydyr sy'n wach erigid wale, os gyn tri mi le pwnt rea mae hygym, gyd cysd yn y tanga. Er no... Wir in Tahir of Flanagan's Kosul Mohan Gaminik, Agus Tamlan Yigshin and Son, the Kurug Draumela and Maharish Gidi in the start, Agus V. Kurud the Shupa or Bun on Ach Nidorm Graven Tahir of Flanagan Rohasta, Leshin, Marvashe, Gurkog Makakredun to Doldofin, Agus Nisgomer of Kish Brabig, no Kadavigish Dacha, Vienis Kosul Drefin, Agus and Christogna, Agus. 
Hvis Bøgg eller Kåle har svin, kan fange sig om igen og mærke en naturisk i. Lige nu vinter jeg en gundre, en jeg ser sin bedre en jeg nedig, tre dig nedig og kul dig. Fader O'Flanagan's association with the official language movement ended with a threatened legal action on his part against the executive committee of the Gaelic League, but his support for the language itself lasted until the end of his life. This is an excerpt from a recording he made in 1938. <laughs> Gudian law at Thai Nuhan, Thai Dinian, Dini a rogo agas at Togu and Erin, Agas Neil and Mass Castaco at Changa and Nashu and Fame. Is Ashtok and Rodeshin. Will in then a sovereign, not will Massega or in Frank Verla. Will in then a in Senyaramine, not will Mass Ega. The first indications of the radical anti-establishment Michael O'Flanagan were seen in Cliffany in County Sligo, where he was a curate in 1914. The Congested Districts Board, a government-sponsored body, announced that in order to conserve fuel in wartime, it was reserving for the use of its own tenants the turf banks which had been available to all the people of Cliffany for generations. Father O'Flanagan, after a long and fruitless correspondence with the board, finally, on the 29th of June 1915, addressed his parishioners outside his church after Mass. Patrick McCannon of Cliffany remembers the incident. There was a a large tract of bog about in the vicinity, never entered by man, but kept by... British imperialism for some on the fine purpose. But this was the landlord's explain. actually, was the, it? It belonged to the landlord or the congested district board where what, they were part and parcel of landlords. And had they taken it over? Or lazy. What, had the CDB, the congested districts board, taken it over? I don't think they had at the time. But Father O'Flanagan recommended that the people go with him to the bog and that he would take it over. and Was this at a, at a sermon or after Mass? or what? It was at, after Mass. He had a public meeting and he recommended to the people that as they wanted the bog, he'd be their leader and he'd bring them to the bog and that they'd uh, take over the bog and that he'd cut the first house himself and therefore he did. Well, after a while then, the, bar, the turf was cut by his, with his cooperation, and the turf was saved, though there were several arrests made. And on, when, when the arrest was made, the people got more determined, and they said that they wouldn't be uh, were intimidated by, by police or any form of imperialism. So the turf was saved, and the next thing, I think I not, I think it was the Sunday, though the police and soldiers were keeping it under observation. The police, the turf was brought and stacked opposite an old school up there, which belonged to the landlord, and as there was a new school built, it was there with nobody living it, and almost directly in front of uh, uh, Cliffany R.I.C. Barrett, which was very, very, fairly strong and well fortified at the time. Next, when the stack of turf was built, there was a banner put across on the face of it uh, with the words beautiful inscribed in Irish, our own turf for our own people, foreigners have no rights here. The fight for the Turbury rights in Cliffany ended in victory for the people, though the Congested Districts Board did get an injunction restraining the turf cutters, and some of them were fined for their activities. Father O'Flanagan's punishment came in the form of a reprimand from his bishop, Dr Coyne, and a transfer to another parish. But the people of Cliffany objected vigorously to any transfer. The next morning, then, the people gathered all together, and 
and every mode of convenience possible was utilized to bring the half parish or the biggest part of into Sligo to interview the bishop. Well, after the discussion and all went on, Father O'Flanagan said he would go quietly and he asked the people to go quietly and that as he was a good churchman and through to Daniels of his predecessor in the Catholic Church, he would uh, uh, he would go quietly. But when the people come home, I don't know, it, it, I'll tell the straight out what exactly we heard. When they interviewed the bishop, he uh, uh, listened to them very uh, attentively and had great sympathy for them as, as far as that went. We don't know whether it was sincere or otherwise, but Father O'Flanagan was not sent back to Clifton anyway. The next thing that the people did, they held another public meeting, and they said they closed the Cliffany Church, and until Father O'Flanagan would come back into their midst, as he was a patriot, an Irishman, and a good pastor, that they wouldn't let any priest go in and open that church until first they'd get their pastor back. But after a while then, through intercession by uh, different clergymen, they said that they'd open the church again. It was uh, transferred to Krasne, and uh, the church was reopened with the understanding that the man that had been sent would be uh, a, good, a good Irishman and a good patriot, just as he was himself. But uh, Father O'Flanagan's involvement with politics on a national scale was really only about to begin on his removal to the remote parish of Crustnall. He was much in demand as a speaker at nationalist gatherings all over the country and he articulated most forcefully the new Republican Sinn Féin policy at the time of the famous North Ross Common by-election of 1917. He it was who was mainly instrumental in having Count Plunkett selected as the Sinn Féin candidate and in whipping up enthusiasm among the campaign workers. And the first thing all of them uh, would admit was that were it not for Father O'Flanagan, they would not have been as much involved as they were, that he inspired them to be active as they were, and he inspired them to do things which they would never have dreamed of doing without his uh, inspiration. And uh, they found him an easy man to work with, a great organiser, and uh, he laid the plans and they carried them out. In fact, when I say carry them out, they literally carried out the voters because it's known as the election of the snows. It was held during a very bitter uh, storm in February 1917. And uh, at that time, of course, only rated occupiers of property were allowed to vote. So in many cases, these were old people who were living in isolated country houses across the fields and so on. And the young men of the district transported them body and bones, carried them on their backs out to the polling booths. And they did this because they were inspired by Father O'Flanagan to be active for the election of Count Plunkett. The return of Count Plunkett to Parliament for North Ross Common in 1917 represented a turning point in Irish history. No one was more aware of this than Father O'Flanagan himself. For months it seemed as if Easter week might be followed by a long period of deep despair. Would the inspiration of the example of the men of Easter week or the terror caused by their defeat have the greater effect upon the mind of the country? For nine long months this question received no clear and convincing answer. In January 1917, an opportunity of solving the doubt occurred at a by-election. A candidate was carefully chosen whose election would be a clear proof that the hearts of the people of Ireland were with the men of Easter week. This candidate was returned by a great majority, proving thereby that Easter week had succeeded in stimulating the national spirit of the Irish people. In his own efforts to rouse the national spirit in those years, Michael O'Flanagan used his great oratorical and persuasive powers to good effect. Marla Comerford remembers campaigning with them. I was among a party of people sent up in the election of 1921 
when it was an election in the six counties and we didn't we'd never been speaking at elections before and we came up a train load of us from Dublin Father Flan in Derry we met him and he came out and he filled us up for he was all warmth when he saw that we needed gingering mm. and he, he put the spirit in us and he sent us off on this election duty and I'm sure we all made magnificent speeches as a result much better than we would have made without him, I'm sure of that well he was a man of such splendid and unique education, he he was a very very um, a good scholar in his own line very very uh, uh, very distinguished and he had the art of talking to people that was a wonderful asset. And another asset was his wit. Michael O'Callaghan again. Some years ago, I received a pamphlet, which was the speech of Father Flanagan delivered at the Bridge of Finney in about 1916 at a commemoration of Miles the Slasher. Or it might have been later than that now. I don't know the exact date. In fact, I think this was the speech which led to his suspension afterwards. And uh, to illustrate whatever point he was making, Father O'Flanagan told the story of a man who had been prosecuted in a magistrate's court for cruelty to a dog. The story was that the man was passing by the house of a neighbour with whom he wasn't on good terms, and the dog came out and attacked him. The man was carrying a hay fork because he was going to make hay, and he warded off the dog with the hay fork and in the course of it I think must have stabbed the dog so he explained his case in court and the magistrate was rather sympathetic towards him but he said to him wouldn't it have been better had you warded off the dog with the other end of the fork and the reply was well I suppose it would have been better and I would have done that if the dog had attacked me with his other end But O'Flanagan's wit was no asset where his ecclesiastical superiors were concerned. His anti-conscription speeches in 1918 in particular brought his second curacy to an end. 83 years old Mrs Patrick McDermott remembers his leaving Cross now. He was so entitled because he was too good a politician and he was all the time talking for Ireland and freedom of Ireland and talking against England and why she should be here at all. The very same as you're talking today in the North. And um, he, uh, the bishop had him transferred. He was afraid, I suppose, there'd be too big a fight in the parish place if it, it had continued. But when he left, the people shut the church doors and locked them. I wouldn't let below any, any other priest say mass. And they used to come and collect outside the church and say the rosary. Uh, crowds of them. And that happened for three Sundays. And then he, Father Michael came down and he asked them to open the church so there was no sense in having it closed. And where was he transferred? He was transferred up to Ruscommon after that. The technical offence for which Father O'Flanagan was deprived of his faculties as a priest was that he had addressed meetings within the boundaries of three parishes in Cavan during the East Cavan by-election of June 1918 without first obtaining the permission of the local parish priests. That the parish priests, like the bishop, were in all probability supporters of the parliamentary party and unlikely to have given their consent anyhow, was beside the point. Well, I suppose I have a feeling now that uh, in the light of present-day circumstances that he was victimised. But uh, I suppose the church wasn't as broad-minded then as it is now. And certainly uh, it would be the view of most people now that uh, he transgress some minor uh, canonical law and that this was used as an excuse if you like to exclude him from church activity because of his strong political views and both church and state wished to silence him because to them he was an extremist Stephen Wren it could have been more to than met the eye um, I don't think anybody thought Father Flanagan was terribly extreme after all, what was extreme in Sinn Féin times? I mean, say, he, 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 we're all extreme. <laughs> um, 
if you were Sinn, if you committed to Sinn Féin, you were as extreme as could be. All Sinn Féiners were extremists yes, of to, course. to a large number of people, weren't they? You know the story about the confession and the uh, the priest, uh, the man said to the priest, I shot a father, what have you done since your last con- confession? I shot a policeman, father. You didn't come here to talk politics. What else <laughs> have you done? <laughs> yes. Well, that yes. was a, a story, I'm sure it's not true, but uh, it, it was the mood. The mood was that you shoot pl- policemen, but you, you didn't, uh, you were none the worse for that. Father O'Flanagan was not in the business of shooting policemen, but he was now co-vice-president with Arthur Griffith of Sinn Féin, and at the very centre of the political movement for independence, the historian Thomas P. O'Neill of University College Galway. Uh, he was associated with the whole political movement, particularly the anti-conscription uh, speech-making and so on, and uh, while he wasn't arrested in 1918, it gave him the chance to be involved with the uh, 1918 election, and he uh, actually read the prayers at the opening of the first Doyle. A story is told, actually, of that, that uh, he himself and uh, Darrell Figgis are supposed to have been coming out together. Darrell Figgis was rather peeved that he hadn't himself been elected and uh, was complaining to Father Flanagan, and Father Flanagan is supposed to have said to him, we're like two old hens looking at our chickens hatched out. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in fact, he went on from there. uh, As uh, vice president, his role became a little more important, perhaps, or seemed more significant in uh, December of 1920, after the arrest of Griffith and de Valera being out of the country. The fact that he sent a telegram to Lloyd George and involved uh, himself in December and January of January of 21, the following year, uh, in negotiations for peace or efforts to make peace, became a very controversial issue. Lots of people in Ireland uh, felt that uh, he had weakened the Irish case because uh, by taking such a step, he had done it without authority, and yet he was the, a senior man as a vice president of Sinn Féin. Uh, and he actually saw Lloyd George in London. He went after Archbishop Clune had made the first steps towards negotiation and after uh, there was a resolution passed by the Galway County Council, which also was controversial, and all of these indicated to Lloyd George that the whole movement was breaking down and that and Lloyd George at that time accepted the advice of his military uh, that uh, they could break the Irish movement within three months and it was felt that Collins was probably right in saying that uh, uh, Father O'Flanagan's intervention at that point did help to strengthen uh, the influence of the military advice on Lloyd George. The abortive efforts of this self-accredited amateur diplomat was Piers Baisley's description of Father O'Flanagan's peace talks with Lloyd George. We asked Thomas P. O'Neill if this indicated a mistrust of the priest among his Sinn Féin colleagues? Uh, well, I don't think so. I think, in fact, Father Flanagan was an individual. Uh, he wasn't in the, a politician in the normal sense. He wasn't tied by the same uh, views of policy and negotiation and so on as uh, other members of committees and, uh, tend to be. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a very good story about... In, about uh, October, September, October of 1920, when de Valera was in America, Harry Boland had come back to Ireland and he uh, persuaded Mrs. de Valera to go out to visit Dev. And he used very strong persuasive measures. He said that Dev was ill and so on. Mrs. de Valera never wanted to travel anywhere and uh, she detested the time she had to spend in America. But when she arrived, a telegram was sent to de Valera by Harry Boland who was in, already in New York as well the moment she arrived in New York he sent a telegram I think de Valera may have been as far away as San Francisco at the time Flanagan here she was <laughs> Sinead Lynn Lanagan and de Valera's first reaction oh my god how will I keep him quiet she <laughs> didn't he thought it was uh, Father Flanagan mm. but uh, you see uh, uh, it uh, indicates a certain element of uh, uh, mistrust of the uh, what he might say, mm. uh, even as early as that, and that was before the Lloyd George thing at all. For several years, from 1921 onwards, Father O'Flanagan campaigned for the Irish Republican cause in the United States. 
but for a man of his individualistic temperament, it was perhaps inevitable that he should break eventually with Sinn Féin also. In 1927, he didn't resign. He was uh, against the resolution proposed by de Valera in the special Ordesh of uh, March of 1926, which de Valera tried to uh, get uh, Sinn Féin at that time to accept that uh, the entry to the Dáil could be it should be a matter of expediency rather than principle, that uh, they could, in fact, go in if the oath were removed. Uh, and uh, Father Flanagan was the man who put down the amendment to de Valera's resolution, which uh, uh, won the amendment won by uh, a very slight majority, but a, a matter of two or three votes, as far as I recollect. But um, he stayed with Sinn Féin when the... Uh, de Valera and his followers left and set up Fianna Fáil. But uh, there was a difficulties in that, new Sinn, in that Sinn Féin after that date because Art O'Connor, who became the new president, uh, ran into difficulties with uh, uh, Mary McSweeney because of his uh, uh, wish to practice in the courts. He was a lawyer and uh, wished to practice in the courts of the Free State. And uh, this was considered to be against the principles of Sinn Féin and uh, he had retired from presidency and I think it's at the same time that Father Flanagan left. Uh, but then he didn't go to Fianna Fáil. In the Irish Free State of the late 20s and early 30s, Father O'Flanagan had a very lean time. But when Fianna Fáil came to power in 1932, Eamon de Valera and his Minister for Education, Tommaso Derrig, found a way of utilising some of his talents. He was put to work on the John O'Donovan Archaeological Survey and Letters and on County Histories in Irish. Frank Ward, formerly on the staff of the National Library, remembers him at work in a special room there. Uh, it, it was known as the Large Book Room and contained uh, outsized, elephant-sized books of various kinds and it was used to economise the space, which was always a problem and still is. He had a special library. staff there too. He uh, had, yes. Uh, two ladies, uh, uh, Miss Nelson who was related to him, and Miss Riddick. They were very charming uh, girls and uh, assiduous workers and helped him in every possible way, and there seemed to be a great mutual regard and respect between them. They uh, certainly uh, held Father O'Flanagan in very high uh, esteem. Had he all the material he wanted around him there, or would he consult no, people no, like yourself? No, uh, very, very often. He had all the, uh, the, the uh, implements of the trade, for research, that is the typewriter and uh, uh, papers and things of that nature, but uh, very often he had to apply at the counter for books and uh, that kind of thing. We found him indeed uh, quite a pleasant uh, man with a great economy of words, never wasted very much time, rather bluff type of man in certain ways, but he had a warm, friendly uh, disposition. Seven of the county histories were published, translated from Father O'Flanagan's English by various hands, but the O'Donovan letters never got any further than typescript. Thomas P. O'Neill had this to say about O'Flanagan's work on the histories. Uh, I don't think he had much guidance on them, and I, they weren't very good. They were quite poor. As a matter of fact, the one particular that I, uh, strikes me is the Carlo County history, which, uh, yeah, which I know a bit because I'm a native of the county and uh, for the mid-17th century he has no reference to the whole Cromwellian change in land ownership in the county. He has three chapters of general history with only one local history reference as far as I recollect in the whole thing uh, in that uh, mid-17th century period. It was based on a, a very early 19th century county history by Ryan. He had no real historical training either, had he? No, he had no historical training and uh, he was too deeply involved with his political idealism to be uh, a good historian. But Father O'Flanagan was nothing if not versatile. He had some reputation as an inventor and his water goggles for undersea use were patented and widely sold in America. They were shown at the second exhibition of Irish inventions, models and aeroplanes held by the National Agricultural and Industrial Development Association in the Mansion House, Dublin, in 1942. Donoghoe Sulawan, who was associated both with that exhibition and the earlier one, recalls meeting Father O'Flanagan at the 1941 exhibition. I was in the 1941 exhibition, and 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 I was in the 1941 
Jag har stått om så att jag går upp i jag kan inte läsa jag ska dåligt in på läsa jag ska kan jag mera gå upp i den där upp i bara här är fyra stora om jag har med egen om är här sin och bättre gumminika hin att plöja läsa en saker jag går över ner i allsjäga för kursi jag ska ner i spesjäga insnära de vid att spänt jag är med kinte dyra jag nåm så går är går nå en vinter vi on fein ach sarev me reglesh ik dir en tran hone shin visa gum guma kadir nuradi avidian tege agas kar er falige agas en speshi vi leri hege igur si kur kun kin an fobel mar dir fa wel kadir nuradi sha avidian tege wel ta kan one come vi an trak to song wel trak der go fol she shin an o flanigan peten water goggles no an ron sul no speckly snava Rodi et sene vi nu sad ege tomodori agas ina dine vi egober fuyniske In his later years Father O'Flanagan devoted himself to his inventions and historical research speaking only on issues which strongly moved him One such was the Spanish Civil War in which his sympathies were very much on the republican side Michael O'Reardon of the Communist Party of Ireland remembers him on his own return from Spain in 1938 There were a group of us we were the last group back actually and uh, I remember we arrived at uh, Western Road Station and uh, we marched with a piper ahead of us. There was only uh, roughly six of us, but uh, friends and sympathisers, roughly about 30 people, marched up Pier Street and uh, uh, it began to rain like hell. And uh, we came as far as uh, Abbey Street and there was Father O'Flanagan up on top of a lorry and uh, he made the speech of welcome back to us, and there wasn't a very big crowd there. But after that, on that same evening, we had a meal with him, and with other people who were associated with the sort of Irish friends of the Spanish Republic. And it was then I got first to sort of chance of discussions and exchange of opinions with him. Uh, on the question of the struggle in Spain, he had no doubt whatsoever because even the very beginning in 1936, uh, he was one of the few who came out very first uh, when the propaganda of the papers, lay and clerical, was at full blast. And uh, he has he spoke at um, a meeting in the Engineers Hall here in, in Dawson Street, uh, a meeting of solidarity with the Spanish Republic. Father O'Flanagan's attitude to General Franco's regime may not have been the most popular in Ireland, yet it was shortly after this that he had his priestly faculties restored and he was appointed chaplain to three convents in the Dundrum Sandyford area where he lived in 1939. It was uh, when uh, uh, Dr John Charles McQuaid became Archbishop that one of the things, one of the first things he did was to try and clear up the kind of remaining problem of... uh, the uh, Father of Flanagan's uh, relationship with the church and uh, he I have no evidence whatsoever that uh, de Valera interfered in any way with uh, in asking Dr. McQuaid to do this but uh, it's uh, certain that Dr. McQuaid as a kindly man would try to solve this in his own diocese anyway uh, because he was a priest not from his diocese but living in it uh, in a kind of difficult situation. And um, also, uh, I think uh, Dr. McQuaid would have been very aware of de Valera's interest in Father Flanagan, because while de Valera and Father Flanagan did not agree on politics, they certainly, uh, uh, certainly de Valera had a great admiration for Father Flanagan, a uh, great regard for him. Michael O'Flanagan died in Sandyford County, Dublin, in 1942. His name may be less familiar than it should be to the younger generation, but we end in one place where he's still remembered with affection and admiration, in Cross Nile, where in the parish church which he once left under a cloud, a plaque from his American friends pays due tribute to one of the most remarkable figures in recent Irish history. In memory of Reverend Michael O'Flanagan, curate of Cross Nile Church in 1915 to 1918, born August the 13th, 1876, and he died August the 7th at 1942. His great work as a holy priest of God and his fearless fight for the Irish freedom shall be a lasting monument to his memory. May he rest in peace.